So we are lucky today. Are we? Because we have another food heist. Oh, yes, we are. Mm. This it's one. It's been a dearth. We, we the, didn't we, have them for, for a while. For a while, did not. Mm. Um, but we have some sent in, in fact, by listeners. So thank Listener you. food heist. Dear beloved listeners. When we um, run out of these, we need you to go out, <laughs> commit a food heist. Yes. So that we can, no, do not break the law. Do not let us know yes. that you have broken the law because of something we said. Mm. If we end up in a courtroom, we're going to testify against you immediately. And we'll be charming and interesting as we yeah. do it. So well, it's well, its own reward. You know, that's, if, if you don't think someone's going to go commit a crime just because you promised to be charming at their trial, that'll totally happen. That is dangerous. Okay, but this is one that a couple of different people sent to me, and it's actually about eight years old, but... In Moscow, right before um, New Year's Eve Mm -hmm. in, I want to say, 2016. Um, That math doesn't work, but go ahead. Yeah. They stole 10 tons of caviar. Okay. Red caviar, Mm. which comes from salmon, which is not the hyper expensive like black caviar that you would get from like sturgeon eggs or whatever. This right. is red caviar. So 10 tons of it comes to 23.5 million rubles, which sounds like a lot. Mm-hmm. That's about uh, third $367,000. Okay. I mean. Yeah. So one bottle of wine mm-hmm. from the big wine heist yeah. is about the same as this, but still 10 tons. It was an organized group. They had to cut a hole through a cement fence. They had to cut holes in the sides of three different, like, steel containers Mm. to steal it all. So it was a big deal, and it, like, ruined uh, all of the New Year's celebrations because that's, like, the traditional thing that Russians have for New Year's, apparently, according to this article on Sputnik News. I was going to say, it's a very festive heist, but it's an anti-festive heist. It's a Grinch heist. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ruined New Year's for everybody. Steal those Russians caviar away? Yeah. Ah, man. Yeah, that is that is that is what we would like to call a jerk move. Because we're, you know. Yeah. A, a, an all... Don't don't do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If any of our listeners commit food heists, yeah. don't take like holiday food. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, you're supposed well, it's caviar though. You're supposed to steal from the rich and give to the poor. Maybe they gave. Maybe they did. Yeah. And all the poor people in Moscow ate so well that New Year's yeah. Eve. Yeah. That's so, what I choose to believe. That sounds great. So the Robin Hood of caviar. He's got ten tons of it on his back. <laughs> <laughs> this turned from a food heist into a bad story idea so fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh speaking of story ideas, um Ooh. last uh last time. We talked about our goofy role playing. We figured mm-hmm. today we should we should be serious. We're gonna be very serious. Discuss a We're serious nigh academic literary topic: death of the author. Death of the author. Death of the author. Which is a metaphor. Yes. Don't uh, <laughs> yeah, don't get don't, any ideas. We can't testify at your trial if you kill us. Yes. Mm-hmm. In fact, I will not testify at your trial if you kill Dan because I'll just be too sad. I will take that. Packed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I will uh, I'll be I'll be crying into my stolen caviar. Um but no, death <laughs> so of what, the author. So what do you mean by death of, death the, author? of the author? What do, what so, do people mean when they say that? Um it has been quite a while since my uh my actual academic classes in this, so I'm mm-hmm. not going to be re- able to remember the um the theorist who initially came up with this. Is one of the famous uh it's a guy, I can't remember his name, but one of the famous sort of literary theorists. I'm sure uh our peanut gallery could look it up. Um but the concept of death of the author is um, as literary criticism in its early stages existed, it was all about author intent. Mm -hmm. Uh, Deciphering author intent, you may have done this in high school. What did the author mean? Uh, And things like this. What is the author trying to say by this image or this symbol or this act, etc.? And death of the author is kind of a literary movement and a uh, a school of thought that there are many different pieces of literary theory that all can play into death of the author. Mm-hmm. But the concept is uh, consider the art as it as itself rather than considering author intent. Mm-hmm. This is different from divorcing the author from the piece in regards to their like sometimes authors, you know, H.P. Lovecraft. Terrible yeah. uh, views. Um, how can I enjoy their piece of uh, of work? Well, death the author plays into that, but the actual literary theory is more along the lines of when you are criticizing something, 
Mm-hmm. Don't consider what the author intended. Consider what the text itself says. Yeah. And this can this shows up in lots of different forms mm-hmm. of criticism. And yes. when, when we say criticism in the academic sense, we're not saying telling somebody that it's bad. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about, well, what does this mean? Trying to, you know, yeah. draw meaning from it or or interpret it in some way. So, for example, historical analysis is very much a death of the author kind of thing, though it can it can swing both ways. Because mm-hmm. uh, you can look at this, look at something historically and say, well, what was the author trying to say? But also, you know, how was the author influenced? How would the audience at the time have in- received and interpreted this, right. et cetera, et cetera, which is very different from what did the author what actually the mean? Author intent? Yeah. And uh, I will say, every time I get into discussions like this, the actual academics, because I'm a fake academic, right? Mm-hmm. They can point out a lot of the problems uh, in the way, like I'll use the wrong terminology. I got in trouble with uh, Nora Jameson once because uh, she really knows her stuff. Yeah. And she's very much an academic. I know enough to say the wrong things uh, because you have to know enough to say the wrong things. And Mm -hmm. uh, I talked about uh, uh, postmodernism using the wrong terminology, and she was absolutely right. Uh, but And she was very charming about it. They put us on a panel uh, at a Worldcon. They're like, ooh, they're going to discuss what... And basically, it was me saying, oh, yeah, I got the wrong terms. I'm sorry, Nora. She's like, yeah, uh, you should use this term <laughs> next time. I'm like, all right. Okay, uh, and I that will. was the extent of our discussion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we turned Maybe it into not something. As thrilling. Not uh, as thrilling the, as they The hoped. kind of famous modern example yeah. of a death of the author scenario Um, or one of them, I guess, is J.K. Rowling. Yes. Uh, And Dumbledore's sexuality Mm -hmm. was eventually, as she wrote the later books, you know, codified into... Later... The thing. Scripts. Yeah. Uh, The scripts, movie scripts, you're right. Yeah. Even in the modern ones, I haven't seen the third one, but I hear she is even a little dodgy about it uh, in committing. But but back when she announced it... Yes, announced that Dumbledore was gay. After the, you mm-hmm. know, Dumbledore is gay, after the seven books had come out, uh, then it was very, then all these questions of author intention arose. Like, yeah. it doesn't show up in the text anywhere yep. at the time, uh, but the author said, oh, he actually is, mm-hmm. and so then there were all these conversations about, well, if the author says he is, even though the book doesn't say he is, does that matter, does that count? And we're not necessarily necessarily going to have that conversation now. Oh, I want to have that conversation. Maybe not about yeah. that specific example. But, but, I want to hear yeah. your opinion. That's what yeah. Yeah. death of the author refers to, yes. right? Uh, I think it's a really interesting theory. Mm-hmm. Um, I do not play into it very much. Okay. Um, basically, being an author, I um, like. I'm a good example of why I think death of the author is, um, I think my oeuvre points out the flaws <laughs> in death of the author because okay. I am writing a giant interconnected universe mm-hmm. of many different books uh, together and not everything can fit in the books. And in fact, a lot of times I have to make very vague references to things because there's just not space. The extra textual things that I add are... I think really relevant and important to understanding the work as a whole. As a whole, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I think that if you look at only the text and not the other things that I am adding and whatnot, uh, you're not going to get the whole picture or the whole story. And I think the author intent is really relevant to something like this, where I'm connecting different pieces together. Mm-hmm. And why I'm doing it and what you're supposed to take out of it is part of the art, right? That's what I would yeah. I would say is uh, asking the question, why is this going on? How do these things connect is a part of what I'm doing as the art. It's not the only thing, but it is like there's a bit of performance art in creating the Cosmere yeah. and interacting with the fans and uh, getting them the answers to questions they have. Mm-hmm. And that fan interaction is a thing that we do a lot today uh-huh. that I consider to be relatively new yes. in literature, mm-hmm. uh, which is not to say that there has never been popular literature. That's obviously not true. Yeah. You know, uh, Dickens and Shakespeare and all of them, uh, I don't know if they did a lot of audience interaction, but, you know, Dickens serialized all of his books. Yeah. And I'm sure that there was, you know, some give and take there and some play going on. Yeah. Um, well, on- that's... 
that's another example. Like, uh, I can't say 100% for sure, but having the notes from Robert Jordan and reading things he was doing, I can say with 95% surety mm -hmm. that he was making alterations to his text based on audience feedback. Um, and so the author audience interaction changed the text. And being aware of that, I think, is an important part of the criticism uh, of a piece of, uh, of art. Yeah. And that if you say death of the author, then I, I maybe I'm defining it the wrong way. Again, it's been a long time, and these definitions can get sticky. Someone in the comments might be like, no, no, that doesn't count under death of the author. But as yeah. I'm understanding it, knowing the author's interaction with the fans and the reason an author might change something because of interaction with the fans is just a really relevant and important part of understanding the work in context as yeah. a scholar. Not necessarily. That's the thing. This is all as scholars. You as readers don't need to know any of this. It doesn't really <laughs> matter. But yeah. You know, we wanted a slightly academic, highbrow topic this yeah. time. Well, and that kind of stuff can be very interesting, and mm -hmm. it can also be completely frivolous. Yeah. Uh, one of the fan interaction things that I have done uh, with my partial series right. is that uh, whenever I would do a book signing for the partial series, uh, which was my uh, first trilogy of uh, science fiction, dystopia, post-apocalyptic stuff, um, the main character's named Marisa, and I mm -hmm. would tell readers at signings and events and things that she canonically has a lower back tattoo that says pertinent to this podcast this space left intentionally blank because that's funny to me mm -hmm. and part of the joke is that it was canonical but never appeared in the text right and i it, it's a stupid joke that i think is funny and it was a fun thing for readers at signings to go oh that's a that's a true thing that is true about the book even though it's not in the text right that's i would say academically an important part of the of the mm -hmm. text in yeah. a way that you are part of the text and your fan interactions are part of the text yeah a a direct death of the author reading would ignore that mm -hmm. and just look at what is contained in the books themselves and frankly would not really be missing anything it's not an important part of the story in this example uh but you know some other ones uh for example the the very first partials book there's a character in there named marcus who nobody liked mm -hmm. he comes across as whiny he is marisa's boyfriend uh, and the best description i ever heard of him was a reviewer who called him the grisham whiny wife why do you have to be off doing great and wonderful things instead of instead of spending time with me? And I thought to myself, you know what? They're absolutely right. That was not my intention with him, but that's absolutely how it comes across. So I set out with the very specific goal in books two and three to make Marcus as lovable and likable as I possibly could. And a lot of people really loved him. And it's it's that direct audience interaction. You don't have to know that about my writing process in order to read the books. Right. But knowing it does add an extra layer of understanding to what's going on in a way that the back tattoo mm -hmm. does not. Right. Well, and I just, like I said, I think it's relevant to criticizing the piece. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, let's give, let's give a fair shake to Death of the Author. Um, why it's relevant, um, it's because art's most important aspect is its effect on the audience, right? Like your takeaway of a piece of art, I think is more important than author intent. Okay. Uh, as an author, I do think it is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if you read a story and it helps you in a way that the author didn't intend, that doesn't invalidate the fact that this story was very helpful to you. Um, right? Like I... Um, I wrote, um, I mean, this is maybe a bad example, but maybe you can extrapolate from it. Uh, I wrote the book Elantris um, about zombies. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read the book, uh, read Elantris, um, it never mentions that word. It's not really about that, but it's the idea of uh, what if, you know, you basically became undead mm -hmm. and every injury or wound that happened to you was then permanent. Yeah, because you kind could of, never you know, heal. You could never heal, but the pain remained. Uh, I started immediately getting letters from people who are like, thank you, you understand my chronic pain. Uh, this helped me deal with chronic pain. 
much better. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that's a mediocre example is I think that was in the back of my head somewhere. But I can't say for sure. It's been 25 years, right? Yeah. Um, my, I know my express intent was, hey, what if I were a zombie and I couldn't heal from wounds? That would sure <laughs> suck. Let's write about it. Um, and so people reading it and then finding this thing that helped them with their chronic pain was really inspiring to me. But it may not have been my intent. And that doesn't invalidate. Does that make sense? And so mm -hmm. the whole death of the author, taking the text as its thing, yeah. um, in a lot of ways, it allows you as the reader to more cl have more claim on something. Be like, it doesn't really matter what the author intended. This is a piece of art. What does it do to you? Yeah. Uh, and that aspect of the criticism and that aspect, it's not really a theory in the same way that like feminist reading is a th uh, thing. Mm -hmm. this, this overarching collection of ideas that death of the author, author indicates, there's some real validity to that. There is, mm -hmm. and I think that that can be really valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a similar experience with John Cleaver, uh, some teenager years and years ago, um, wrote me a series of emails mm -hmm. asking, you know, can I write some fan fiction about John Cleaver? And I'm like, as long as you don't sell it, yeah, go, mm -hmm. go for it. Totally happy. And then came back several more times, ob obviously kind of circling around a, a central question, and eventually that turned out to be, I'm pretty sure that John Cleaver is ace. Can I please write mm. a story in which he is ace? Uh, and he's not. I mean, canonically, he right. falls in love. Uh, he, you know, he is a heterosexual necrophiliac. Like, I've, I've made that very clear over the course of six books. But it was very important to this person, mm -hmm. possibly working through some of their own stuff, to read him that way. And then to create their own art that saw him that way. And I'm like, absolutely, go for it. That mm -hmm. sounds great. And that ability to pull something out of a work that is valuable to you, even if the author didn't put it there on purpose, I think is a really important part of what makes reading great and what makes us love it. What do you kind of think of then in the general sense, fandoms like claiming a piece of art and in some cases, you know, Firing the creator of the piece of art and making it their own. Like Harry Potter, there is so much more Harry Potter fanfic than like, I would guess that- Than the original Harry Potter? I would guess that most things have more fanfic than the original, mm -hmm. but Harry Potter is in a league unto itself. Yeah. The number of Harry Potter fanfics out there is mountainous. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more Harry Potter fanfics than, you know, some publishers put out in a year. Right. Yeah. Uh, more Harry Potter fan books come out in a year, and like the community has like certain themes that are accepted as canon to the fans. If you're doing certain mm -hmm. ships or things like that, yeah, that are not canon in the books, but it's this thing where it's like if you're going to do it this way, everyone knows you have to do it like this, and a lot of the fanfics play into this. It's yeah. really fascinating. That that fanon that mm -hmm. has grown up around yes, them. Yes, that's the word, the fa fanon, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would add uh, Star Wars. Yes. Like, there's an entire generation of people growing up uh, who consider Dave Filoni yes. to be the, the creator, even though he didn't originate Star Wars. Right. He is the one that they consider to be the one at the helm mm -hmm. and right now he is the one writing most of the stuff and that there's a, all kinds of legal issues in there because it's not fan fiction it's actual fiction but right he's written and produced so much more star wars than lucas ever did yeah and there are a lot of people who kind of see him that way as the fan has taken over legally in this case yeah. but yeah i mean that's one of the reasons why i said no to more Wheel of Time. Um, I wasn't close to having written more than Robert Jordan. I'd mm -hmm. only written three. Uh, but the publisher would have been perfectly happy for me to spend 20 years writing more Wheel of Time books um, and came to me and Harriet. Harriet had the final call on this. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, but they came to Harriet and me and said, we want you to do this next series. Uh, this next Wheel of Time series. And she came to me and said, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't think the Wheel of Time should end up having more books not written by Robert Jordan than were written. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the main points. I mean, she had already felt this same way, but she wanted, yeah. she's, she's a wonderful human being. She wanted to make sure what I felt because, mm -hmm. you know, 
So yeah, saying no to that, like, but that's not to say that Dave Filoni did anything wrong. I'm yeah, I mean, absolutely not. No. Yeah, uh, um, Star Wars is a very different beast, and his work is, by all accounts, incredible. I haven't watched like some his animated ones that mm-hmm. uh, that he was at the helm at, but yeah, yeah. Um, this you know an, another kind of academic term for what mm-hmm. we're talking about is the difference between a writerly text and a readerly text. Yes. Uh, do you remember those terms I from do. college? We, we use those terms. Uh, it's been a while. Okay. Um, but uh, there are some texts. Let me Tell me if I'm getting this wrong. There are some texts that feel like they are written specifically for critics and other authors. <laughs> uh, is this what this term means? I don't know if that's what it is intended for uh, what but what 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 i, I remember those i don't terms. know because yeah. i'm not entirely sure either okay. and well, and this is where you we reach the limits of our knowledge yeah. i know that i have studied this but yes. i graduated from college decades ago yeah um and i am an english professor at a college but i teach creative writing so yeah which is different uh, than uh, literary I'm, analysis i'm an artiste i mean the, the basic idea is that there are some texts texts and I, I have to assume that a given text can be either, depending on who is, mm-hmm. is looking at it. Uh, but there are some that uh, a, a writerly text is one where you see very clearly what the writer intended. And okay. he is trying to tell you something. Okay, so Whereas a the... readerly text yeah. is open to interpretation and has enough give in it that you can pull different things out of it. So this is just the old Tolkien uh, C.S. Lewis argument, right? Yeah. Where... Tolkien despised allegory. I think mm-hmm. abhors allegory is what the word he used. Yeah. Uh, and C.S. Lewis really wanted you to know what his book was about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if you somehow missed that the lion was Jesus Christ, then he has not done his job right. Yeah, um, and, and he would be very upset. Mm-hmm. And that is a very writerly text. He yeah. is trying to say one thing, mm-hmm. and you should interpret that one thing Whereas other writers are, no, there's lots of other things like uh, Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. Right. Why did he turn into a bug? We are never told why. What does it mean that he turned into a bug? We are never told what it means. And everyone who reads it is free to come up with their own interpretation and find whatever aspect of their own lives resonates with suddenly being a bug and interpret it that way. So that's a much more readerly text. Yeah. uh, You mentioned Kafka side. Um. (laughs) I'm curious if any of our audience or if you did this back in the dark ages before we all had the sum total of human knowledge in our pockets. Mm-hmm. Um, I would sometimes be caught as a young man in a situation with nothing to read yes. and have to wait for my mom to get finished, you know, talking with her friends or whatever. I would be at somebody's house and be like, ah, man, I forgot my book. And so the number of times I read Metamorphosis because I went to the bookshelf and people would have the literary classics or the mm-hmm. collection or something I'm like, is there anything sci-fi fantasy in here? They're like, um, well, it has I Metamorphosis. Guess this I, one. I guess I'll read it again. Uh, <laughs> like, if you were lucky, it had a Ray Bradbury story. Mm-hmm. Um, but most often, it's like, well, guess I'm gonna read some more Kafka. Because uh, at least somebody turns into a giant bug, which is not even which really a fantasy story. Tangential yeah. to science mm-hmm. fiction, but yeah. yeah. So that's delightful. I would read that story and then be disappointed every time because I'm like, I mean, I understand you it's didn't a great eat work of anybody. Yeah, it's a great work of literary literature. It means a lot. It's great to discuss, but I just wanted a sci-fi story, and <laughs> it's a story where a person turns into a giant bug that isn't a sci-fi story. Um, tangent to your tangent. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is how my brother became an author oh, late yeah? in life. He hated reading. He hated writing until he was early 20s and uh, he ended up in the hospital with my mom. She has uh-huh. MS. She frequent hospital visits. And he, on the way out the door to drive her there for something, grabbed whatever was closest on the shelf, which turned out to be Huckleberry Finn. Okay. Yeah. And... Uh, decided because he was stuck there for several hours, I may as well read this stupid thing and absolutely fell in love with it, became excited about literature, um, you know, much later in life than than I became excited, mm. uh, but then ended up getting published before either you or I. He did. Because he is a jerk. Uh, 
No, he's awesome. He's a pretty awesome jerk, but he is. He, mm-hmm. I mean, he has to be. He yeah. Beats the two of us. He comes and saunters into our writing group. Oh, I wrote a book, guys. I wrote a book. Uh, oh, out of nowhere. No. And then he sells. It wasn't that one. He sold and we're like, one. your book is terrible. And he mm-hmm. said, yep, it is. I'm going to write a different one. And he went off and he wrote it and he sold it. Yeah. And you and I were like, what? Yep. This shouldn't even be allowed. Tangent to the other, the tangent back to. Okay. Do you know how many times? Well, it was only once, but uh, I remembered it every time it happened after that. Uh, I was in junior year uh, Mm -hmm. high school in my AP literature class, and the teacher said, our next story is The Dead. And I went, whoop, (laughs) really? (laughs) Our next story is The Dead? Oh, I'm going to like this one. And then it was James Joyce's story about people going to a party and how they're all dead inside. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a... You thought you were going to get some uh, awesome <laughs> zombie thing. I really thought. I'm like, ooh, this is going to be like Dracula for zombies. I thought that there was some story out there mm-hmm. that was the progenitor um, of the zombie mythos, not knowing at the time that it was film, not Yeah. Uh, you thought stories. you were getting Night of the Living Dead, yes. and instead you got James Joyce. And I got James Joyce. And every, like I got assigned James Joyce the next year in my next English class, and then in my freshman honors English class at BYU. I had to read the Dead three years in a row, and every time I'm like... Should be a zombie story. Should be a zombie. So you need to write a big zombie epic and call it The Dead. Mm. And then you need to have someone assign it in high school English. That said, I did kind of kind of like Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man just because it was so wacky. Mm-hmm. It was so weird and out there. I know it's yeah. not Finnegan's Wake level weird, but it was just the right amount of weird for me to be like... What what is your favorite James Joyce? It's Portrait it of the Artist. Portrait of the yeah. Artist. Uh, and I don't love James Joyce because I have this bad taste in my mouth because of the dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because James Joyce is the favorite of uh, English professors to be like, let's talk about what it means and the metaphors and what does the cave mean? Wink, wink. Um, uh-huh. and, yeah. uh, and all of that. But I thought Portrait of the Artist legitimately, I'm like, changing writing styles as he aged and doing all of these kinds of things was mm-hmm. was actually really cool. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's the one I have to begrudgingly say. I've never tried Finnegan's Wake. What about Ulysses? Ulysses? Because Ulysses, yeah. I've never actually read all of, but what portions of it I have read as I attempt over and over, I actually really love. I like Ulysses also. Um, I just, Dubliners is the one that I'm like, I've read too many times. <laughs> right, uh, but Portrait of the Artist just because that textual stuff. Ulysses does yeah. some of that too, but mm-hmm. uh, but anyway, that's yeah. that's, that's off. Talk that's about way uh, off. Talk about readerly, um, Very readerly texts that yeah. one. Yes, but also an author that, as I understand, really like to put things in there for the people who are criticizing his work to try to figure out. Uh, and uh, James Joyce, <laughs> um, just to screw with people. That sounds like a James Joyce kind of thing. Yeah, I, as I understand, he just he did it, um, like, on purpose. On purpose, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some of the, you know, I don't want to insult the the great Irish hero James Joyce because, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, um, because uh, my house will get burned down <laughs> by a specific person. Mm. Not just we're not just bagging on Irish people in general. I assume. You know, they do like their James Joyce. Emily went to Ireland. I've never been. She's like, wow, there's James Joyce stuff everywhere. You've which, never been to Ireland. Never been to Ireland. You should go. I know. I, I have been to Dublin and uh-huh. loved every second of it. I thought it was amazing. Uh, Emily loved it as well. I have this thing where um, whenever I go uh, to the British Isles, I'm being brought by my publisher. Mm-hmm. And the publisher, being English... Uh, just kind of pretends that Ireland has isn't no there. interest. Yeah, in, yeah. Mm-hmm. I uh, I went on a book tour, mm-hmm. which I believe I had to schedule independently of yeah a British book tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did end up in Ireland, and it was a lot of fun. They'll begrudgingly send me to Scotland, right? They'll be like, <laughs> "Well, you can get I there via guess. train." So, all right, you you'll have a signing in Edinburgh. Mm. Um, but I've never been to Wales. Never I've been never, to Wales. Yep, I've never been to Northern uh, Ireland or to Ireland. Um, and I've been to, you know, England and Scotland like t- two dozen times maybe uh, and never, okay. yeah. I, I know you're not in general a TV guy, but I'm, can I recommend a TV show to you? 
Sure. You can recommend anything. <laughs> uh, Whether, Dairy yeah. Girls. Okay. Which is a uh, sitcom. It's got three seasons and mm. it's done. Okay. Uh, it takes place in Northern Ireland in the 90s during the Troubles. Okay. It is one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Okay. It's uh, very foul mouthed. Okay. Uh, but like season three that I just finished watching, mm-hmm. which I had to cheat and use a VPN to convince BBC Four that I was in England in order to watch, literally every episode made me tear up at some point while also being hilarious and wonderful. It's you such a good show. actually did the thing that the, all those VPN commercials that like there's any number of them, the, you did the thing that they say you yeah, can do. I, it's apparently legal. Well, they I can, did it. Mm-hmm. That's, that's how we watched stuff when we lived in Germany yeah. was via VPN. And I haven't done it since until I found out, wait, season three of Dairy Girls is available in the UK. Well, McAfee. <laughs> Let's convince a website that I'm in the UK so I can watch these. Mm. It's totally worth it. Unless I get arrested, in which case it was still worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. uh, are there authors whose works have changed for you as you've gotten to know the author? Because this Ooh. is something that happens with us that de- doesn't happen as often with the average reader. You get mm-hmm. to know people, right? Like, I got to have dinner with Guy Gavriel K. Um, and uh, he... how did did uh, how did that change? Because I know you're a, yeah. a fan of K's books. Mm-hmm. You were the one that got me to read K. Yeah. Well, I'd already read Silmarillion without knowing. Yes. Uh, but you're the one who who convinced me to read Tigana. Uh, did meeting him change your opinion? Yeah, it kind of did, like all in favorable ways because he was delightful and charming. Mm-hmm. Um, but I got to, like, I could put a face and a voice to the story. I mean, a better example of this is Mary Robinette. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I have I know her and I know she does audiobooks, even when I read one of her books not an audiobook, I hear her voice reading it to me. <laughs> which changes my experience. Like I, I've said mm-hmm. before, like particularly when I do the audiobooks, I just can listen to any, uh, I'm, I'm a bad judge for which of the best uh, Mary Robinette books because any of them, it's just my friend <laughs> reading me a story and yeah. I'm just I'm just enjoying it because I enjoy spending time with my friend and my friend is now reading me a bedtime story. <laughs> Isn't that great? Uh, that changes my reading of a text. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a, a, an experience similar to this with uh, Fonda Lee because uh-huh. I read the Greenbone Saga and thought that it was incredible and brilliant. Uh, Jade War, the mm-hmm. second one, it, to this day, m- one of the best fantasy books I've ever read in mm-hmm. my top three easy. I have heard that from multiple people. Uh, so good. Mm-hmm. And I liked it so much that I was able to contact her and say, hey, do you want to be on writing excuses? And then we ended up spending a whole Saturday together and- listening to her talk about how and why she did the things she did made me like the book so much more. And I'm like, oh, wait, I missed how much more was going on in here uh, now that I have gotten to know you and I'm seeing this through your perspective absolutely made me appreciate the the series even more. Now, you know, the opposite effect is Brian McClellan. Since I know he is an <laughs> utter doofus, I read his books differently. <laughs> <laughs> I love Brian. He's a good friend. Of I talk ours. to Brian literally every day. He is a doofus, though, uh, and he is a goofball. Yes, who uh, you know the things that he loves. Mm-hmm. You know, n- no reading his books and knowing him and his new one in the Shadow of Lightning. It's great, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, best I fantasy I've read it. all year. Yeah. So good. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I absolutely see so much of him in there that the average reader is not going to see. So that that totally changes the way that I read things and the way I perceive things. I love Brian, but my favorite Brian story, I might have told it before, is just how one time we were out to dinner together mm-hmm. and uh, I was talking about how, you know, I just, I write compulsively, right? I just, this is where the secret projects come from. I yeah. really enjoy this. And Brian was looking at me like I'm an alien. <laughs> like I, I have the proverbial <laughs> third eye growing on my head. He's like, I do this because I'm good at it, and it's a job I can do, but I want to be playing video games, Brandon. That's what I want to do with my time. Why were you, are you doing extra? Stop doing extra. It makes us look bad. And that was, uh, I, I, he was joking about it, but he approaches 
story and storytelling very differently from the mm-hmm. way that I do. Um, and I had to then put on my former Brian McClellan professor hat for one year, my first year teaching 20 years ago, and be like, you need, you need to do your work. Keep writing. Do your homework. Do, you, you, you go back and get off my lawn, kiddo. Uh, one, one specific story. He's like story. two years younger than me or something, but he's still a kiddo. <laughs> he's, he's much younger than me. Is he? Are. Yeah. How, how old is he? He's is... mid 30s. Wow. He's at least 10 years younger okay. than we are. All right. He just, you know, yeah. that beard, when you get a beard and you get the gray in it, you yeah. look very distinguished. It, emotionally, he's much older than we are. Yes. He's mm-hmm. a 60 year old man inside a 35 year old man's body. <laughs> I hope he doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> he, he knows that. He's the one who told me that. Nobody send this episode to Brian. <laughs> now they're all going to do it. No, uh, I do know one fun story. Uh, Mm -hmm. that is a very uh, death of the author kind of thing. Um, In in The Shadow of Lightning, Mm -hmm. uh, there's a kissing scene. Uh And I got to that kissing scene and remembered uh, that he worked directly with Charlie Holmberg, who writes fantasy, and kept sending her drafts to say, okay, what about this? How can I make this Uh. work? How do I do all of it? So there's a lot of Hidden Charlie Holmberg influence. You know, in I ought to do that with scene. Charlie sometime and see. Yeah. And Charlie's uh, Charlie writes romantic fiction mm-hmm. um, and does very, very good, job good. Of it. Uh, very yeah. excellent fantasy mm-hmm. romance. Yep. So, yeah. How's that, Ben? Or Brian? Or Charlie? <laughs>